Hello, this is Melinda Pettengill, um, coming back from my second webinar for Utah Coalition Against Sexual Assault. If you're hearing this is my second webinar and you haven't watched the first one, I would encourage you to pause this now and go back to the first webinar, which has an emphasis on trauma and an introduction to um, trauma in the brain. Today we're gonna be talking about trauma's effect on the provider. So those of you out there that do advocacy work, nursing, anything in the medical profession, therapy, um, any type of provider, including administrative work, really the truth is nobody is exempt from interacting with trauma. So welcome to one and all. Um, Again, if you haven't watched the first one on an introduction to trauma, I'd really encourage you to do that. Um, as we get started today, I have a couple of um, audience members here, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. We'll start with Morgan. Hi, I'm Morgan. Um, I work in an administrative role at a rape crisis center, and I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. Nice. Welcome, Morgan. And my name is Sterling. I'm a social worker at a hospital. Nice. Thanks. Thanks, Sterling. Thanks, Morgan. Um, for those of you that are watching this via webinar, um, I, I want to ask a question. Um, well, you know, I didn't introduce myself. Melinda Pettengill. I'm an LCSW. Um, have spent most of my career in trauma work, uh, domestic violence, crisis work in a hospital setting, and also now for the last several years, rape recovery work. Um, I'm currently the clinical director at the Rape Recovery Center in Salt Lake City, um, and we partner with UCASA for a lot of the work that we do. So, welcome. Um, it's great to be here. Those of you that are sitting um, in front of your computers or at home, um, I, I hope that you will uh, follow along as we ask questions and answer questions. We're going to start off with... What brought you to your work? Why are you here? And as Morgan and Sterling take a minute to think of their response to that, um, I'm going to answer the question just to start us off. What brought you to your work? Um, I initially came to the field of social work um, after committing to the, the idea of teaching, of um, wanting to um, make you know, the world a better place. Um, Quickly, in my teaching experience, I recognized that there were lots of barriers that children were experiencing that were preventing them from being able to learn um, that were bigger than academics. And as I got to know the kids and their families, um, I recognized that there was a lot happening for people that created barriers and prevented them from being able to show up at school and show up in their work environments and other places in the way they wanted to. So social work became an option for me. Um, but bigger than social work, trauma became a focus for me. What are the barriers that people encounter regularly that are shifting or changing the way they um, understand themselves and the world around them? What are some of the barriers that get in people's way from being able to live the life they want to live? So um, as we kind of talk about this today, that's the lens through which I'm approaching it is um, you know, what, what are some of the barriers that prevent us from being able to live the best lives that we can, or, or at least be able to live the most authentic lives that we can? Um, that's for our clients, and also for today, we'll be focusing um, more so on that for us as providers. So I'm going to turn it over to Morgan and Sterling. What brought you to your work today? Um, well, for me, I think coming from a background as a survivor myself and having so many around me affected by sexual assault. It was always something that I was compelled to volunteer and be a part of and um, kind of drawn to working within a space that kind of acknowledges the way that that as a, as a power dynamic affects all of us, you know. So, um, yeah, I feel very fortunate to get to work in this field. Yeah, so maybe if I'm hearing you right, um, in part of your own healing process, mm -hmm. from your own trauma, it mattered to you to make things different or better right, for the people for around the people, you. Yeah, to help others. Okay, and I think the truth in that is as you heal, so do the people around you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Morgan. 
All right, Sterling. So I got involved with this field because of my best friend growing up through elementary school and junior high, went through a lot of abuse, and I was kind of discouraged to see that they couldn't get the help that they needed and that no one was able to realize the help that they deserved. Um, and then to see them grow up into an adult and still not know how to get that or where to go, that's why I got involved with the work. Nice. I think what I love about both of your answers is I, I don't think it happens out there that anyone is brought into this work in ways that aren't deeply personal and deeply meaningful. Sometimes there are exceptions to that. But for most people that are heavily impacted by sexual assault work, they typically have some personal connection to the work. I think sometimes in, in schools of training, schools of psychology, schools of social work, we sort of try to ask people to distance themselves from what brought them to the work, to not tell the truth about you know, their experience. Um, I, I do understand why that's encouraged, you know, not making it about us, keeping it focused on the client. And yet, at the same time, I don't think people can do this work effectively and stay in it in really sustainable ways if they aren't telling the truth about who they are and why they're here. It doesn't mean it's being told at every moment in every scenario, but being able to at least tell the truth to ourselves really matters. So for those of you that are watching the webinar at home or in your workplace, I want you to ask that question to yourself. Maybe pause the video. What brought you here? Truly, what brought you to your work? All right. So now we're going to step that up a little bit. In addition to what brought you here, what feels meaningful about what you do? For me, I can say that what feels meaningful to me about what I do is I think being able to, to neutralize for people. When people come in and they say, you know, I'm crazy, I can't sleep, I have flashbacks all the time, I'm struggling with this, everyone in my life is rejecting me because of how this trauma has impacted me. We get to sit with the realities and truth of, of what that's like for them, the pain of that, um, this kind of the secondary trauma, the trauma that came in after the initial blow, um, and really be with the idea that the truth of trauma, the truth of your experience, is your responding or reacting in a really normal way to a very abnormal life experience. So we get to neutralize some of that meaning making that we you know, decide I'm bad because I show up this way or because I wasn't able to get over this. Um, I love people being able to respond to themselves um, with compassion and understanding as opposed to judgment and criticism. Um, I think for me, I it's really meaningful to be able to help individual clients when they come in and, and be that person. Um, and I additionally have the opportunity to fundraise, and that is very meaningful for me to be able to provide means to expand really good work and support individuals and larger projects that all um, kind of focus around helping helping individuals. Cool. Thanks, Morgan. And what's meaningful to me is knowing that I'm able to bridge the gap and give someone the help that they need um, to kind of um, fulfill myself and know that I can actually do some good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I like that. I think, you know, it's pretty rare that we like create spaces where we get to talk about um, why do I keep coming back? Why do I keep coming back to this work? I think what's complex in it is that so much of what feels meaningful um, can also contribute to some of what leads to burnout. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but um, thank you for sharing. The next question um, it, people don't like to talk about quite as much, and yet I think we have these answers really at the tip of our tongue most of the time. So the next question is, what feels difficult about your work? Um, for me, I, I can answer that by saying, you know, the truth of trauma is it's very disruptive to the lived experience. I kind of make the comparison over and over again that it pops up like a computer virus, takes over, I can't access my email, I can't access 
what I'm trying to accomplish or get done shuts things down in some ways. Um, trauma can feel so disruptive. And I think sometimes as the provider, when we are doing some really great work and we're seeing some really great changes and the trauma is showing up so disruptively and kind of one step forward, two steps back, um, that can feel really overwhelming to me um, when I recognize that clients are doing really, really, really hard work and they're not necessarily always getting the results that they need, which can sometimes show up as like really frustrating and irritating to me. Um, <clears throat> I think um, it's difficult for me sometimes working in area in a space that just naturally has a high um, level of emotion a lot of the time from clients and and what's happening and that can be overwhelming for me and just a work environment and um make it a little bit hard to switch over to kind of focus on administrative type tasks or something that's like that um kind of making that quick switch back and forth can be overwhelming at times yeah, that, that resonates with me, too. Thanks, Morgan. And what feels difficult for me is I talk to all these people all the time that are going through their own kind of stuff, and sometimes it feels like I'm absorbing it all and trying to find a way to deal with that for myself is what's most difficult for me. Yeah. I think you're touching on something that's really important for all of us, Sterling, which is human suffering is so big. And we're going to talk about this pretty extensively in the next few minutes. But um, why does other people's suffering have such a large, extensive impact on us? And I think, e you know, some easy answers probably come to mind. But we're going to talk about the real ins and outs of that and what we can do to address it um, from a primary prevention, a secondary and a tertiary approach. Okay, so just to get us started off, it's always fun to go straight to the meat of our work. Um, I want you to conceptualize or think about an experience you've had recently um, that felt really difficult to you in your work. So maybe you had an interaction with a client or a patient. Maybe you have some conflict with a coworker or a boss. Maybe you got a performance review you weren't thrilled with. Maybe you didn't get the promotion you were looking for. Maybe you got yelled at by a client. Um, maybe you got fired by a client. I think there are lots of options in this. So anything, the first thing that comes to mind for you, a difficult experience you've had with a client, patient, or coworker recently. And I'm going to ask you to just hold that for just a minute. Just kind of hold that experience. I'm going to ask you a few questions. Um, not related to your exact story, although um, I, I would love to hear what your stories are. But those of you that are listening on the webinar, I want you to take a minute to pause. What's a difficult experience you've had recently in your work with a client, patient, or coworker? And everyone, if you could just take a minute to close your eyes and notice what comes up in your body as you reflect on this situation. I'm thinking of a conflict I had with my boss and I immediately got enormous amounts of tension across my shoulders, my chest, my belly, my fist balled up. I went into protective mode. I have to protect myself and my idea in this. Any sensations either of you are noticing in your body as you think about this difficulty or this conflict? Uh, back to sadness feels like not good enough. Okay, so you immediately kind of attach that to an idea as well. Is there any sensation that you experience that kind of represents sadness? So like maybe droopiness or Droopiness, I feel tired, I want to okay. crawl under a blanket, drink some tea. Okay, all right, thank you. And interesting that it, you already kind of landed in that place of like, maybe I'm not good enough in this. All right, Morgan. Um, I feel like tingly. My skin feels like numb and like kind of squishing in on my body. I don't know if that's real, but yeah, <laughs> that's what it feels like. Your reality is our reality in this. So <laughs> <laughs> whatever you feel is real. So I'm wondering, as you think about kind of that sensation and the conflict, how does it impact the way you feel about yourself and your skills? Sterling already answered that a little bit. Is there anything else you want to say about that? So my example 
that I was just thinking of that happened last week was a doctor um, came and told me I did something wrong, which I did. That's fair. Um, but the delivery of it was poor, and it kind of felt like he was berating me, and I'll never be good enough. So it kind of makes me question my skills sometimes. Okay. About am I good enough to be doing this work? Yeah. Thank you. I think that's that's a um, really honest um, response. Thank you. Yeah, I I can definitely relate to that because I think the experience I'm thinking of recently involves a client being upset and that's also just really ignites feelings for me of not being good enough and that I'm that failing in that specific relationship with someone trying to support um just really yeah makes me feel like I'm not doing the right thing or what I should be yeah so both of you it sounds like some inferiority is coming up in this kind of distressing event or this painful event. Yeah, for me, I notice um, how how it's kind of impacting the way I feel about myself and my skills is that my boss doesn't trust me. And more so maybe kind of that idea of like, maybe I'm not enough. And then, and then anger, how dare you? <laughs> um, how does it impact the way you feel about your client or your patient, your coworkers, other people in the scenario? Oh, I think for th- for the one that I'm thinking of, it made me not like the person because they were they were upset, and I wanted to leave and and not interact with them anymore. And that was also hard because then that makes me feel like I'm not doing my job if I want to leave an interaction that's uncomfortable with the client. But it really I didn't like them. Yeah, I really relate to that. In mine, I was like running away into a story about how my boss doesn't know anything and she's not even qualified to tell me if I should do that or not do it and that she's not acceptable the way she is. More so, it just made me feel like I needed to protect myself and run away from her. Um, My initial reaction is um, kind of anger and I don't want to deal with them ever again. Mm -hmm. Um, My more rational thought is to work with them and learn what I can to be better at what I'm doing. Hmm. Interesting. I think it's really interesting, too, that you went straight to action. Like, what? what's my action in this? Um, I'm wondering if I can push on you ju- for just a minute. Um, you mentioned the doctor. How did you feel about him? I kind of feel like he isn't a great people person because of the way he carried himself and his attitude when speaking with me. That was my first thought. Um, I also kind of thought he was heartless. Yeah. No, I think you're both bringing up some great examples. Sort of when we experience distress in our work, we immediately go into strategy. How is this person bad or how am I bad? And how do I avoid feeling or experiencing this ever again in my life. We start to strategize, make plans. I'm never talking to her again. I'm never interacting with him again. Um, And I think this is all like bringing us exactly to where we want to be. That's pretty heavy stuff, right? That can feel big. I have to avoid this person for the rest of my life. This client doesn't like me. My boss doesn't accept me the way I am. It's big, right? And this isn't something that's unique to our field right? Something that is really common with humanity. But today we're going to talk about how it specifically impacts us in our field. So I want to ask you, as you think about sort of your story about the other person, how they were acceptable or not acceptable, um, what you wanted to do, run away, I wanted to tell my boss she wasn't qualified to make her assertion. I'm wondering, what does that experience you had or the thoughts you're having in that? What does that say about you to you? For me, something that comes up for me is that um, I can't be with a different perspective than my own. I'm not open to anything that's not seen the way I want it to be. And then I kind of move into this direction of like, oh God, I'm not good enough the way I am. This is not okay. I'm not acceptable as is. Yeah, I think it makes me, you know, I feel like I can't handle, (laughs) similar, like I can't handle people being different, probably like 
people being upset with me and uh, at all. It just makes me feel like I can't, I'm, I'm failing and that I'm bad at this work and just because it's that emotional response of that I'm not, yeah. Yeah, again, so kind of heaviness, judgment, criticism of self. Judgment of myself yeah. for sure. Definitely like why can't you handle this kind of thing? Like you should be able to cope with people being upset with you, mm-hmm. I guess. Do more, be better. What about you, Sterling? It just makes me realize like I don't always have the highest self-confidence and a lot of self-doubt. That's mm. kind of what it makes me realize. Yeah. Well, I think what's interesting in this is so often in our work, you know, when we do crisis work, when we work with trauma survivors, we are actually engaged in our own experience as well. So when I'm interacting with people who are in crisis, who are struggling, not only is that really big for me, it also often says things about me and my own value to myself and the world around me. So we're just going to hold that as we kind of move through our presentation today. Doing crisis work is big, not, be- not just because of how big it is for the people we're working with, but because of the very real impacts it has on us. You know, if I make a mistake on an email, a typo, or I'm running numbers and I make a mistake, I'm not sitting in the same grief and the same judgment and the same criticism of myself that I do when I get negative feedback from a coworker or a client or someone that's in distress or crisis. So we are holding some really heavy things. And when we work with trauma survivors, we are all automatically being exposed to trauma ourselves over and over again as secondary trauma. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what's the impact of sitting in secondary trauma all day, every day for a career. In a recent study conducted at the University of Georgia on the prevalence of traumatic stress experienced by therapists working with trauma survivors, McBride found that exposure to others' trauma doubles the risk that therapists will experience PTSD symptoms themselves. Doubles the risk. You know, that's a pretty big... um, That's a pretty big uh, jump right there, doubles the risk. Social workers may hear about burnout and self-care, but they aren't hearing about and preparing themselves for secondary traumatic stress. The good news about this is if we know what we're looking for and we're actively working to address it, we can reduce that to the same extent. We can reduce it. But the problem is people come into this field because they're like, this will make me matter. This is so exciting. This is the work I've always wanted to do my whole life. I can make the world a better place. And they're not getting the preparatory information, skills, and support to really help them navigate the realities of secondary trauma. I love this little meme. I'm not anxious. I'm just extremely well educated about all the things that can go catastrophically wrong. <laughs> right? Um, I think sometimes, you know, we work with people um, that struggle with humanity, and we are people that struggle with our own humanity. And so being able to conceptualize us as human beings that are impacted just as heavily by other people's suffering um, helps us prepare honestly for what we're dealing with. Um, there's a great book called Strom- or sorry, Trauma Stewardship. Um, I recommend it to all advocates, police officers, nurses, doctors, anyone that's regularly faced with um, working with other people's trauma, other people's suffering. Um, in that, it talks about trauma exposure response, the transformation that takes place within us as a result of exposure to the suffering of other living beings or the planet. So trauma exposure response essentially changes the way we see ourselves and the world around us. I want to ask both of you, what feels different to you about you since you began your work? And in asking that, I will let you take a moment to think about the answer. But those of you that are on the webinar, I want you to think about that. What feels different to you about you since you began your work? I think for me, One of the things that I first noticed after I graduated from graduate school about 14 or 15 years ago was I felt really cynical. Every situation I would go into, I could see all of the bad. I could see all the oppression. I could see all the ways, you know, people might be 
experiencing power and control dynamics. They might actually be a domestic violence survivor. I would sit in a movie and I would tease out everything that was wrong with the movie, everything that wasn't healthy, that wasn't okay. I could go on a hike and literally think about who may or may not have thrown themselves off of this cliff. Everything began to shift for me. I was looking for really painful things in every situation I was in. I felt really cynical. And you know what really changed about my life in that is I could see it really impacting the people around me. I could see it impacting my partner. I could see it impacting my family members. I could see them withdrawing from me because it was so heavy to be with me all the time. I don't think that's everyone's experience, but I really jumped in both feet. Morgan or Sterling, do either one of you want to respond? Um, I think for me, um, it's easier to just kind of show up for myself, trying to, like, understanding ways to communicate others to to do that for them for themselves and just kind of being okay with my feelings about who I am and what I'm doing and uh yeah not trying to change them just observing myself without judgment I think I've been able to do in a lot more tangible way since okay. working in this field so for you it's required a lot of acceptance work and just kind of yeah. accepting what and you like don't control continual constant work yeah <laughs> Okay. But I've maybe maybe that it's been more maybe I've been more aware that I need to do that and that's what the change has been more. Okay. So um how about you, Sterling? Have you noticed anything's changed about you since you began doing um crisis work in the hospital? Um, I've noticed that ever since being around lots of traumatic injuries that I find myself more anxious about my family members and other loved ones. Um always worrying about the littlest things and when they aren't punctual oh did they get in a car accident was the last time i saw them the last time i'm ever going to see them uh, just a lot of anxiety about that yeah that makes sense we start to kind of think about when we feel so powerless what do we control and maybe it's worrying um being anxious about something so what causes this what causes trauma exposure response what causes me to be super cynical or what causes um, Sterling to really be kind of anxious about his family members and friends' safety? Um, well, there are a couple of things that do. And, and again, I would put a plug in for you watching the first video <laughs> because as we kind of get familiar with the human brain, that helps in this process. Um, I know probably most of you have heard the word burnout. The definition for it is a sense of emotional exhaustion, feelings of inadequacy, questioning our competency, um, and there's a difference between questioning our competency versus efficacy. I think it's good for us to question how effective was I versus questioning am I okay as a human being in this. Um, but also uh, something that, that becomes really, really, really present in trauma exposure response or secondary trauma um, is stress, just legitimate stress environmental demands, internal demands that tax the adaptive resources. Morgan, I think you were talking about, you know, when clients get really upset with you, their voices are raised, they're demanding things be a very specific way, that impacts your body, right? It impacts how you're experiencing your workday. You want to make it stop, right? Which means you want to figure out how to give them what they need, and you can't always do that. I think that's really common with our work. Sometimes what people need that are experiencing trauma or what they think they need maybe doesn't even exist. So that can be really taxing for us as the one that's trying to support that person. Um, something that's interesting about studying stress in the body is that human beings are so fascinating because if they experience things as a challenge, this is a challenge I'm taking on, versus a threat, this is a threat to me, um, they have very, very, very different experiences in the body. So, for example, Morgan, if someone's yelling at you and you're seeing that as a challenge to be able to support or help the situation versus, oh, my God, this person's screaming at me at the front desk and I don't know how to stop it. I don't know how to make it go away. Those two show up very differently in the human body. Um, the threat, when it's a threat, there's a flight, fight, freeze instinct that kicks in. The amygdala takes over. We often prevent thoughtfulness and problem solving. We kind of freeze up and we're not sure what to do. 
In a challenge, the body mobilizes similar to a threat, but the mind is still flexible and open to changes or alternatives. So what are all the options? What are all the possibilities? Allowing space for creativity and thoughtfulness. The individual becomes excited, and there's a lot of positive energy around that. The challenged teacher in a challenged mindset is a motivated um, experience. So one, of, one example of that, the picture I've got up here, is that you know if people um, are on the Titanic and their, their ship is sinking and they're thrust into the ocean with freezing cold water temperatures and ice all around them, that oftentimes results in freezing. I mean, li I mean, literally, like the fight, fight, freeze instinct to like kind of slow down, and people do freeze to death. It's, you know what we saw happen. As opposed to the polar bear challenge that you've probably heard of, where people for raising money will jump into you know a body of water in the middle of winter with ice all around them and then quickly jump out, they experience it very differently. They're motivated. They're excited. There's all sorts of energy all around them. There's a group spirit. There's a group dynamic. And so that really does impact the way we experience the distress that's going on. So for example, let's go back to to mine, my boss doesn't agree with me. She's telling me I'm not doing it the right way. And if I'm perceiving that as a threat to me, she doesn't think I'm enough. I'm not okay the way I am. That's impacting my ability to do my job in a way that feels um, motivated and helpful to me. If I'm seeing it as, oh, we disagree. feels important to me that she hear my side of it. I don't control whether or not we agree on this but it's more of a challenge to connect and see each other's perspective. It doesn't feel threatening to me. However, we don't always have the mindset to work that out for ourselves, right? Stress is just an innate part of our lived experience. It's an innate part of our work, everyone's work. Something that's really common to our work is when people are experiencing trauma or they're in a lot of distress, we see what's called emotion contagion dynamics kick in. Um, Anybody familiar with the concept of emotion contagion? All right, I'm gonna play this little video clip for you so you can watch a brief description of it. Um, but I also want you to think about when does this show up for you? You know, back to Morgan's story of the client yelling at her at the front desk and Sterling's story of the doctor talking down to him or condescendingly telling him what he should have been doing differently. Um, how then might emotion contagion jump into all of this? Well, cheese. If you find yourself smiling too, it's not his charm. We mimic each other's facial expressions, posture and elements of speech all the time, mostly without actually realising it. Back in 1992, researchers looked at the activity of single neurons in the brains of the macaque monkey. They came across a system of neurons that fired both when the monkey performed an action, grabbing a peanut, and when the monkey observed a researcher grabbing a peanut too. The researchers called the system mirror neurons because the neurons reflected a behaviour, even though the monkeys weren't performing that behaviour themselves. And mirror neurons aren't just a monkey thing. There's evidence for the system in human brains too. In one study, human participants were shown a face with either a happy, angry or neutral expression, but only for 30 milliseconds. The expressive faces weren't on the screen long enough for the participants to notice, so they had no idea that they were being subconsciously exposed to them. Still, the participants who were shown the happy face had increased electrical activity in the muscles needed to smile and mimic that face. And those shown the angry face initiated the muscles needed to mimic the angry expression. It's thought that we mirror behaviours and facial expressions to help us understand the emotional states of others and learn by imitation. In another study, researchers impaired the participants' ability to mimic faces by having them chew gum or hold a pencil in between their teeth. Their ability to recognise some emotional expressions, like happiness, was impaired too. So this mirror neuron system isn't only connected to our movements, it may also be connected to our feelings. In a recent study, participants were shown videos of a hand in either visibly cold or visibly warm water. While watching the cold water video, the participants' hands dropped in temperature. Researchers dubbed this temperature contagion. 
the drop in temperature was more noticeable in participants who reported having higher levels of empathy. But we can't say if this was caused by mirror neurons or not. Some neuroscientists are sceptical of the mirror neuron theory and say it's been overgeneralized. While research into our neurons' role in imitation is ongoing, we do know that we're primed to mimic what we observe, from cracking a smile to the point where we can catch a cold without actually experiencing a change in temperature. It really is a case of monkey see, monkey do. And if you haven't already, subscribe to BrainCraft. I have a new episode out every Thursday. Okay, so just in understanding emotional contagion, the idea behind it is that as human beings, we regularly look to the people around us and not even without our conscious thought, we mimic what we see. I have a great example of this. I have a seven-year-old and a one-year-old. And um, it was really funny. One day I was sitting up at the table with my one-year-old feeding him. He was eating and the seven-year-old's playing in another room and I hear the seven-year-old hurt himself and he starts crying and he comes in and the one-year-old's just watching him and he's watching the seven-year-old cry and he just bursts into tears. And it startles the seven-year-old so much that the seven-year-old stops crying and looks straight at the one-year-old, whom also stops crying. The seven-year-old is like, hey, don't take my attention, or some form of that was happening. And he starts crying again, and my one-year-old starts crying immediately. There's no conversation that's happening. But the more time we spend with human beings, we do absorb through that facial mimicry, that evolutionary process, we absorb what we see being experienced around us. Moral of the story is, if you're working with trauma survivors all day, every day, there's no way for you to be exempt from this experience of emotion contagion. You're not even choosing it. Your body, in some, way, in some senses, kind of betrays you. you mimic what you see in front of you. And that allows us to be empathetic with each other. It allows people to feel heard and validated. It also can be really heavy for the provider. Moving on, um, I think where we boast, bo I mean, where one of the best places we illustrate that is in studies res regarding voice and affect mimicry. So hyperverbal, raised voices, aggressive or desperate tone, or even docile limp tone tends to impact the way we are experiencing our bodies. Someone else is yelling, our heart starts to race. We start to experience the tension or the stress, the anxiety or the pain that the people across from us are experiencing. Now, that doesn't mean we always do, right? We're not always experiencing that. But there is an impact on us. We can see that just through the way the human body survives, experiences things. Um, I, I have a... I had a client a while ago that um, she regularly shouted in session. And I would recognize myself really getting activated by this, feeling a lot of um, just kind of dreading, you know, what's she going to be like today, feeling scared, getting anxious about it. And so I really started thinking about this idea of um, emotion contagion and kind of voice and affect mimicry. And I decided, I oftentimes will take a few minutes between each client and really kind of just do a meditation or a mindfulness activity. With this client very specifically, I would practice. I would sit in my seat, do a meditation, and in my mind, I would grow my legs into the ground like a tree trunk. Like I can be like a tree. Trees experience all weather. They experience the storm. They experience the wind. They experience all things. And as I prepared myself for that, I'm going to stay put no matter what. I'm going to take care of myself in a stable and a solid way. It legitimately changed my experience of this client. I stopped dreading her emotion. I stopped fearing the intensity of her reactions and was able to work with her more effectively when I got myself taken care of and grounded in the situation. What are some of the costs of empathy? When we have a, a job, you know, nursing, even s police officers, um, therapists, advocates, etc. What are some of the costs of empathizing with people's suffering? Um, well, 
it, it, for one thing, creates a resource competition, right? If I'm a mother and a partner and um, various other things in my life, it starts to take some of the resources I have that I just kind of have every morning when I wake up, I have this much energy to give. If I'm constantly needing to empathize, that does impact my parenting, my schoolwork, the other things that I deem valuable in my life. I mentioned this earlier, but when I first started social work, I was coming home every day from work and I was wanting to talk about all the hardships of my day with my partner. And um, that wasn't sustainable. It wasn't a sustainable dynamic long-term. Um, which doesn't mean you know you don't show up for each other, but I was taking up all of the space and all of the oxygen in the room with how hard and traumatic the work I was doing felt. Um, we also, in addition to um, resource competition, we have increased sympathetic, sympathetic and cardiovascular arousal. So chronic stress affects health more than any other single factor, including heredity. So for people that work in crisis-oriented fields, the emergency room, a rape crisis center, um, some of the other places that um, you all are coming to us from, it legitimately does have an impact on our, on our health. Now, I think I've painted a pretty bleak picture. <laughs> it does impact us. It impacts us emotionally. It impacts us physically. It impacts us spiritually. It impacts every facet of our being, um, including we see um, uh, people in the service field, so advocacy, social work, therapy, um, you know, uh, police force, nurses, doctors, et cetera, as, as some of the people that need um, treatment for, for anxiety and depression at greater and higher rates than other fields. Um, we see this really legitimately impacting those in our work. Um, some of the symptoms of trauma exposure response. So as I go through these, I really want you to think about, are these things that show up for you on a regular basis? Are you experiencing this regularly? Feeling helpless and hopeless. I can't do anything about this. I can't make this better. It's too big. A sense that one can never do enough. My work never ends. The pile just gets bigger and bigger. Hypervigilance, constantly looking for the scary thing or the big thing or the hard thing every time you turn around. Diminished creativity, I don't have time to paint. I don't have time to sing or to hike or to walk and play with my dog. Inability to embrace complexity. No, it's this one way. It means this one thing. No, one's that a no one that is a perpetrator could be a victim seeing things from really, really, really dogmatic perspectives. It's this way or it's this way. That can be a really strong indicator of, str of trauma exposure response. Um, chronic exhaustion, feeling tired all the time or having enormous physical ailments, migraines, headaches, body aches, feeling sleepy all the time. These can be indicators of trauma exposure response. The inability to listen. I remember this happened to me in my first job doing domestic violence work. I would do intakes and people would come in and I'm like, yeah, 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 I know your story. And that didn't serve me. But I recognize now that it was a way I was surviving. It was a way I was navigating a really difficult dynamic. Um, dissociative moments. I check out. I don't hear what people are saying. I don't see what's happening in front of me. I lose moments. I lose track of time. When I'm listening to people's really difficult stories, I'm making my laundry list. I'm making my grocery list. Or a sense of martyrdom. I'm the only one that can make this work. I'm the only person with the skills to help you. Guilt and fear. Guilt that I can never do enough. Fear that I can never do enough. Anger, cynicism, blame. This was one that I really struggled with early on in my work. Anger, cynicism, and blame felt really protective to me. If somebody else was at fault, I could survive it. If I was really angry about it, I could protect myself from it. Um, addiction. Um, it, it's interesting because sometimes I, I will talk with people about, you know, uh, does addiction ever impact you in your work? And people are like, oh, no, 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 I, I rarely drink, I don't smoke. 
But something that's fascinating, especially in our fields, is that oftentimes people will sort of um, pummel sugar at human service providers. You know, there's the joke about cops and donuts, but really like when you walk into nonprofits, I think sometimes cookies and candies and things like that are one of the ways we're kind of surviving. Um, uh, nobody on the webinar or here with me here that, I, that sugar's not acceptable. But it is absolutely one of the ways that we cope in our work. Um, grandiosity, this idea that no one's ever had things worse. This is the, the most difficult client there's ever been. Grandiosity, lack of boundaries. I'm not ever able to say no. I can't set boundaries or limits around what I do. My job just spills into every aspect of my life. And escape fantasies. I think this is the one where you find yourself leaving staff meeting where there was some conflict and you go straight to a job board. <laughs> you go straight back to your computer and start looking at who's hiring. We start to have escape fantasies. I'm going to give up on my life. I'm going to run away to Costa Rica. I'm not going to do social work anymore. I'm going to go work at Starbucks. That's mine. I'm raising my hand. I think it would be delightful to make coffee all day. Um, or we start thinking about, you know, I, I joke with people um, that are like, I'm not going to do this work anymore. Um, or I'm going to have a baby to get out of this. <laughs> Just these escape fantasies can look very different to different people. So Morgan and Sterling, were there any of those that you heard just now that, that were something you could relate to or something you've experienced in your career or in your work? Yeah, Sterling. Escaping, like, that totally sounds like something I would do. I, like, want to go live in a small villa in Europe and drink wine all day and not interact with people yeah. and just take care of myself. Yeah. And what's interesting about escape fantasies is like the minute you go there, you go there in your mind, it actually does have a soothing effect. So it can like slow down the adrenal glands. It can slow down the intensity or the chaos that's coming up. And it can feel helpful. The challenge with escape fantasies is you're never escaping yourself. You're always taking yourself with you, right? So some of these drives to make your worth meaningful for you. That's coming with you. It's not, not, you're not escaping yourself in that. Morgan, was any, did anything stand out to you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think um, definitely kind of the disassociation component, I think. I have a tendency to do that for sure when I'm forced into things that make me uncomfortable, so. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that, that one, <laughs> you know, that one's real because that's, you know, oftentimes what we're working with our clients on is coming back, yeah. being present. Mm -hmm. But so often it is such a coping skill for so many of us to leave. So, yeah, I appreciate you saying that one. So we're actually going to do an activity together right now, a, utilize a self-evaluation tool or it's a self-assessment tool. I'm going to give you about 10 minutes. So those of you that are on the webinar, um, this is part of the time commitment for your hour-long presentation. You're just going to take a minute, click on the link to the, the self-evaluation tool. And just, I'm gonna ask that you be really honest with yourself because the truth is no one's ever gonna see this except you. You're really just trying to get a feel for where you're at. So take, so answer the questions honestly, and then there's a scale at the end for you to rate it. So I'm gonna give you maybe 10 minutes to fill that out. Um, be as absolutely honest as you can. Um, the more we start from where we're at, the better we do at addressing some of the challenges that come up in being exposed to secondary trauma all the time. Okay, did everybody get a chance to fill out the self-evaluation tool? Yeah. Anything come up for you in that? Well, yeah, it was it was a little bit surprising actually to see kind of in a tangible way that I think my work it does affect me and um it was a little bit surprising to kind of check into. Yeah. All right. It definitely had some impact. Thanks for sharing. I know I, I've filled this out a few times and I think I sometimes am surprised too, um, at how often my work is impacting mm -hmm. how I feel about myself my mood, et cetera. Sterling, anything come up for you in it? No, this didn't really tell me anything new. I'm fairly self-aware and 
it, nothing really surprising came from this. Do you think that your work impacts you in some of these areas? Definitely, yes. Okay, but you had some awareness of that. Yeah, I already knew it did. So. All right. Yeah, thank you. So those of you that are on the webinar, just kind of assessing, what does this say? Kind of my work, you know, based on the information we just talked about, the impact of stress, the impact of secondary stra traumatic stress, the impact of sitting in other people's suffering. Because the good news in this, and there's lots of it, is that just like any other thing we prepare for, um, you know, if you're getting ready to run a marathon, you don't just do it the day of, right? You do lots of little things ahead of time. And the truth of this concept of burnout um, or addressing um, secondary traumatic stress is that it actually does require a lot of work. It really, truly does. Um, it's good work, though. It's work that most of us enjoy. So um, I, for those of you that are familiar with Besser Vandal Kalk, who, um, you know, has, has a lot of really great leading research on the impact of trauma on the body. Um, in his book, <clears throat> he shares the research on what differentiates providers in debilitating trauma responses from those who are able to integrate and adapt. So he literally tracks several people doing our work. And the results he came up with is the people that do these things versus the people that do these things do well. Stress resilient people are capable of negative affect when faced with adversity. But a belief in their commitment to themselves and their own well being is the single greatest factor in thriving versus striving, surviving. So, a belief in your own commitment to yourself and your own well-being above anything else in your work is the single greatest factor that differentiates providers from thriving in their work versus surviving in it. And I think that's interesting because that's a very different idea than just self-care. That says, above and beyond everything else in my work, I am fiercely committed to my own well-being. Part of that is psychological, right? If you watched the first webinar on trauma, another plug there, we do recognize that these neural networks that start to fire together kind of wire together and create our reality. So if I am having a thousand thoughts a day about how I want to take care of myself versus never thinking about my own well-being or not prioritizing it. I'm having a very different lived experience. Sometimes I say to my staff, at least, I don't even think that means you have to change your behavior enormously. Are you already brushing your teeth? And my staff will say yes. And I'll say, what would it look like for you as you brush your teeth to not think about the next task you have to do, but instead to think about being really nice to every single one of your teeth as you brush? The goal is not that that's going to immediately change your life. It's that it's creating new belief systems about how much you matter in this. Every one of my teeth is important. I want to be kind to every one of my teeth. If you're already eating breakfast, sitting down, looking at your breakfast, and taking a moment to appreciate the reality of needing to take care of your body, needing to fuel your body, feeling grateful that you're taking a moment to take care of your body. We're not talking about vast changes. And the people that um, uh, uh, Vanderkolk did the research on didn't have enormous shifts or changes. They had small shifts with the relationships with what they were already doing based from a format of I matter. I am my first priority. I am the most important person in my lived experience. And I think that sometimes feels hard for those of us that came into this work as trauma survivors because we're like, no, 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 no. The thing that makes me matter is taking care of people that are suffering, of taking care of my children, of taking care of my partner. And those people regularly end up in a situation that is surviving versus thriving in their work. That's not to say I don't think there are good intentions behind it. It just doesn't lead to the outcomes that we're looking for. 
moving on. How do we do this? How do we do this? It's hard. It's hard to change our relationship with the way we perceive ourselves and our value in the world. It can be done in little ways, incrementally. We have to start by telling the truth. How many of you answered the questions on that paper with the utmost honesty? I think sometimes that's hard. We kind of sit with this idea that maybe somebody's looking over our shoulder, maybe someone's judging me, maybe someone's um, sort of thinking about me differently based on my answers. We have to start by telling the truth. If we are to do our work with suffering people and environments in a sustainable way, we must understand how our work affects us. We need to undertake an honest assessment of how our feelings or behaviors have changed in response to whatever trauma we've been exposed to. I remember when I first started working in the field of sexual assault, I made a promise upwards, backwards, downwards, forwards that my children would never have sleepovers. Nothing good ever comes from sleepovers. And I really had to sit with myself in that. What has changed in my life as a result of what I've been exposed to? I cannot protect everyone I love from experiencing trauma. And I will run myself into the ground trying to do that. Now, does that mean I don't be thoughtful about choices I make? It's not the same thing. Begin by telling the truth about where we're at. That requires that we be with where we're at, sift through it, look at it, be present with it. Sometimes we recognize that the most um, taxing coping skills or approaches that we have to our work is by creating so many barriers, so many protective factors. I'll never do that. I'll never do this. I don't ever have time for self-care. There's so much to be done. We start creating so many barriers for ourselves that we begin to create um, fences, moats, alligators. And what we, s what we soon see is that we find ourselves locked in by the very defenses we've constructed for our protection. So sometimes we're looking to make everything okay and safe for everyone around us so that they avoid suffering. The challenge with that is that pain is part of living. And it's the resistance to pain that causes the suffering. Sometimes those in our lives actually do have to struggle. Those of us that are exposed to trauma pretty regularly for really good reasons are afraid of that impact. Um, and yet, there, there is not such a thing as creating all the defenses that keep us safe. So what do we see in trauma-resilient providers? What's there? What's very present with trauma-resilient providers? It's not a lot of things. It's not a list of 20. It's a list of four. <laughs> the first one is trauma-resilient providers believe that they have a sense of personal control. That does not mean that they control the people around them or the things around them. They believe I'm powerless o over other people. I accept that. I can't change the decisions my clients make. I can't make them not go back to their abuser. I can't make them do their lives differently. I am powerless over other people. I am not, however, powerless over myself. When my client makes a decision that feels painful to me, how do I show up for myself in that? With kindness and compassion and fierceness. How do I show up for myself in ways that are meaningful? Sometimes I notice when I struggle with um, some of the work that I'm doing or decisions maybe my staff are making, um, I do small things, small gestures. Like I take my, my hand and I'll put it against my heart. I'll put it against my chest as just an act of kindness to me. Sometimes I take both of my hands um, and, and we'll imagine one being more of a vulnerable self and one being more of a comforting self. And I hold hands with myself as an act of kindness. Again, creating those neural networks that fire together that say, I really matter to me. I am my first priority. Um, secondly, they have a pursuit of personally meaningful tasks. They're engaged in their own lives. Their hobbies are not going home and reading more about sexual assault and rape. Their hobbies are not going home. I, I kind of laugh. I, I get text messages or Facebook messages from acquaintances from 20 years ago where they they know that I work in sexual assault work. And they'll send me a message I haven't heard from, from tw for 20 years. And they're like, you would love this movie. It's all about rape. And I'm like, interesting. 
yeah, thanks for sharing. And simultaneously, I'm aware that I have to engage in things that are, are beyond just the work that I do. The work I do is important. It's not the only thing to me. I have to hike. I cook. I garden. I play with my children. I spend a lot of time meditating. Um, I travel. I connect to the things that make me bigger than my job or that are bigger than my job. Um, my time is my time. I saw a funny meme um, probably two years ago when President Obama was still the president where he was in the shower and he was saying out loud to himself, I am not my job. I am not my job. I am not my job. <laughs> I think that reality is true for any really stressful job. We do have to remind ourselves, I'm not my job. My job is my job. I am me. And take a step back from that and create hobbies or create things that make us different or separate from our jobs. We have to make healthy lifestyle choices. I kind of, um, again, bring this up in that I'm not asking you to do majorly different things. You take a three-minute break to walk outside and literally just breathe outside air. That changes those neural networks that move together and fire together and say how much Sterling values himself, how much Morgan is prioritizing herself. I do stretches. I do small yoga stretches in my chair. Again, just an act of kindness to myself, of mattering to myself. Um, I, I am, am not the best with healthy meals. I'm really not. I do the best that I can. And some days I will make decisions where I'm like, I am taking this cucumber and I'm going to eat it. Not necessarily because I love cucumbers, but because that's a kind thing to do for me. Sometimes I do the same with candy. Like, I'm not going to spend all day every day eating candy, but I am going to have a pe couple pieces of candy because that's a really fun and kind thing for me. What I find myself when I'm not firing on all cylinders or not thriving, but more so surviving, is I haven't eaten, I'm starving, I'm looking for some kind of sugar to get into my bloodstream so I can survive the next thing, and I'm shoving candy into my face. That's a very different experience than I'm doing this really nice thing for myself, right? So shifting our relationship with what we're already doing is huge in this. Brushing each tooth and thinking about each tooth individually. Um, social support. So having friends and family in and outside of our field of work. Sometimes it can be helpful to talk to people who understand your experience, who've lived the, the, the traumatic experiences you have. And sometimes it's really important to have friends that talk about other things, that can talk about sports, that can talk about TV shows, that can talk about things that feel fun and exciting to you and take you outside of your work. That's not a lot of things, right? In fact, I'm going back. Sense of personal control. I'm powerless over other people. I'm not powerless over myself. Pursuit of personally meaningful things. I want to learn about the solar system. That interests me. I want to follow this television show that feels interesting. Um, healthy lifestyle choices. Um, maybe you can't eat three healthy meals a day. Maybe you can eat one. And that's where you start. Um, brushing each tooth with kindness. <laughs> um, and then also social support. If you don't have friends outside of your work, outside of the work you do, because oftentimes that happens. We have similar training. Those are the people we meet. Lots of people are friends with their work friends. Finding ways to make friends. Go to the dog park. Talk to the people with dogs. Learn about having dogs. Whatever that looks like for you. Go to a paint class. Do whatever it takes. I know not everybody wants to be extremely extroverted, and that's okay. I think the, the point is that we're connecting with people that maybe aren't doing the exact same work we're doing. Okay, so now we're going to do a different self-assessment tool where we're going to be really assessing where we're at personally with self-care. This is another honest conversation you're having just with you about how well do you already do with taking care of yourself and prioritizing yourself in your life. So I'm going to give you about five minutes to fill that out. We'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about what your, what your findings were. Okay, we're back. What was that experience like for you guys? Um, well, it was interesting to like check in with everything. I think I need to do a little bit more work taking care of my physical body and kind of what that looks like. 
and felt like I am well in tune with my emotional kind of wellness and, and taking care of that. But it was it was interesting. There are it was there. There's a lot of so little things to tangibly think about in the matrix of being well. Yeah. Good. I think noticing any small improvements you can make, even in physical health, just standing up and walking around your office a couple of times, these don't have to be huge shifts. Small shifts have the same psychological impact on us that large ones do. Sometimes even better because we don't feel like failures as often in it. Anything come up for you, Sterling? Yeah, I realized that I take really great care of myself. I do fail, however, in the spiritual self-care area. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes I think that is one that gets neglected um, because sometimes we don't even know how to go about that. Connecting with ourselves, um, connecting with nature, connecting with the things around us um, that matter. Um, yeah, I think looking at this with honesty allows us to be really present with what do we want to shift. Maybe you don't have an interest in shifting your spiritual health, but being able to get really real with what does feel important to you about the rest of your wellness plan. Okay, so where do I go from here? Where do we go from here? Burnout is inevitable. We accept that. That's not just true of our field. Burnout is true of all people. People get overwhelmed. People get stressed. People want to break. That's real. Um, this is a learning process. No one's ever arriving. If we accept that, it doesn't feel as elusive. No one's ever arriving. We're working towards it. Practice making your wellness a priority. Um, the impact of that alone is psychological. Relating to what you're already doing changes your own psychology around how you prioritize yourself. Um, keeping commitments to yourself or starting with wanting to keep commitments to yourself. Maybe you commit to, you know, drink four large glasses of water a day and you want to do that. And maybe you get to two. Starting off with the desire makes, can impact the, psych, the psyche in the process. Planning to respond instead of react involves intention. What are your strategies for taking care of yourself when you're struggling? I'm going back to that moment where you expressed or you explained, you know, that you had some distress with a coworker or a patient or a client or a friend. What is the way you respond to yourself in that? When I got an argument or, or got some feedback from my boss I didn't like, my go-to was to blame and criticize her, and then I turned on me and blamed and criticized me. Things that can feel helpful in that process is, is, is even just a conversation of neutrality or kindness. The truth is I'm doing the best I can with the tools I have. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. I am trying. I really am. So shifting the way you're relating to yourself in this experience or this work. So putting it all together. I'm going to give you an opportunity to really create a map for yourselves. The challenge with this is it always feels good when we, when we hear it. We're like, oh, yeah, I want to start hiking again. Oh, yeah, I want to start doing this thing again. But really, the most bang we get for our buck is to sit down and make a plan. What are some realistic things I can do? And again, very small is a great way to start. I'm going to share mine with you. Um, in my own Burnout Awareness and Action Plan, um, and by the way, these tools were created by the Utah Center for Evidence-Based Treatment. They are a fabulous partner of ours that do a lot of great work around um, taking care of trauma providers. So um, these tools came to us from them. Um, when I recognize I'm in the green, things are going well, I feel okay, I'm thinking of work fondly, I'm contemplating new interests, I should host a dinner party, I should start a new project, I feel optimistic. My thoughts, um, those are my thoughts. My behaviors, I exercise most days, I'm playing with my kids, I'm joking, I'm, see I'm seeing humor in mistakes. My sensations and feelings, I'm calm. I have compassion for others, I'm excited, I experience humor, wonder, appreciation. I'm open to a fuller range of emotions. Um, I, for example, I'm willing to share sadness and not feel down on myself in that. 
And my response to keep myself there is to continue taking mini breaks during the day, breathing, yoga, time with friends, hobbies, outside of the mental health field, and daily meditation. When I'm in the yellow, when things are starting to get a little bit not so great, I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling as great as I am in the green. My thoughts are blaming others. People can't drive in Utah. Um, I have to hurry up to get work done. I should make myself work out. When are my kids going to bed? Um, I'm obsessing over errors. Um, my behaviors are rushing through tasks, being late, losing things, Netflix binges, I can't deal, I'm escaping into this place of non-reality. Um, I have increased mistakes. Um, my sensations and feelings are impatience, frustration, fatigue, guilt, restlessness, neck tightness, distracted. My skillful response is to show up for myself with compassion, reduce my workload, take mini breaks, massage, walks between sessions, cleaning my house, radical acceptance, accepting things as they are, doing what works, um, setting a finish line for my work. Even if it's not the finish line, it's a finish line for today. When I'm in the red, <laughs> I am judging others' behaviors. I'm failing at everything. I can't handle this. I don't like people. I'm questioning my career. I'm engaging in escape fantasies all the time. My behaviors are I'm yelling in my car at my kids. I'm not letting small things go. I'm sighing a lot. I'm waking up at night thinking of work. I'm arguing with my partner. My sensations or feelings are shame, agitation, back pain, overwhelming fatigue, sadness, demoralization, pessimism. Does this sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> and then my skillful response is to take a mental health day reorient to core values, find compassion for myself and others, intense exercise, solitude, get outdoors, travel, um, uh, have a come to Jesus from a caring person helping me get reoriented to my life and my values. So the idea behind this is you're asking yourself to get really self-aware. When I'm in the green, it looks like this. This is what I do. This is how I stay there. When I'm in the yellow, it looks like this. When I'm in the red, it looks like this. Part of it is you're accepting that all three of those things will occur in your experience and your life. You're accepting that. And you're also making plans for how to address it when it happens so that you can bust this out, put this paper out in front of you and be like, oh yeah, I wanted to do this when I'm in the yellow. I wanted to do this when I'm in the red. So, sorry, skipped ahead. You're going to spend the next five minutes looking at your own plan. Green, yellow, red. What does it look like for you? And how do you want to respond to it when it happens? Respond is a very different word than make it go away or make yourself different than you are. We're responding. The emphasis is on kindness and compassion. Okay, ready? Go. Those of you on the webinar, why don't you pause this and take five minutes. As you are sort of thinking about what your action plan looks like, I want to even just emphasize that just in making this plan, you're shifting your relationship with yourself in it. Psychologically, there's value out of just the idea of planning to take care of yourself in that. So if you didn't get to finish your plan today, I'd encourage you to take that home with you. Put it somewhere visible where you can see it. Have a conversation with the people around you, your partner, your roommates, people that feel close to you, about what it would look like for you to really emphasize your own wellness and to accept that I will struggle. I will go to these places over and over again. And here's how I'll take care of myself in them. Um, lastly, as we close, I love this quote, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and go do that. Because what the world needs is people who've come alive. So when you get stuck in this place of how do I fix all the things? How do I be all the things for all the people? Remember that there's legitimately nothing you can do that's more effective for humanity than to really emphasize your own wellness and your own well-being.